beat. I'm so sick. I don't know what to do. And I would say, Carlton, first of all, tell your doctor. Go to NIH. Call them up. You know, tell them that there's something wrong. And he would say, I have, I have, honest, I have. Primetime obtained copies of NIH medical staff handwritten notes on Carlton. Notes showing that he'd been complaining about various symptoms for weeks. And that for over a month, doctors refused his repeated request to lower his dose of FIAU. Did they dismiss all of his symptoms? They, had, they had a reason for everything. They said <clears throat> stomach problems were because of, um, he had a spastic, had had colon problems in the past. Dr. Hufnagel admits Carlton and some other patients were making complaints, but they were the kind of complaints he expected as reactions to a new drug. Is this a patient saying that uh, makes me feel yucky or makes me feel tired or he needs stomach cramps? As far as a systemic severe toxicity, that wasn't there. But Carlton's symptoms continued, and when they got to be too much, his friends say he asked to drop out of the study and got pressured to stay in. He told me one day that he wanted to stop the drug. And the doctor said to him that if he stopped the drug, it would ruin the study. Carlton's sisters, too, felt their brother was being pressured. I don't think he used the word chastised, but he was kind of scolded for not taking the dosage like he was supposed to. Who was scolding him? One of the doctors that he was seeing. And, I mean, all they could think of was having their name on having found a cure for hepatitis B at whatever cost. Patients are all free to stop the medication. What pushed us to keep him on the medication was that he had cleared the hepatitis B virus, and he was very excited about that, and we were very excited about that. Postnagel says he and his team had every reason to believe that FIAU was working and that there were no major problems. He says it turned out to be the most potent drug ever tested on hepatitis B, and it was promising in animal tests and in an earlier short-term test on humans who took the drug for one month. But the new test in March with Carlton and the other patients was supposed to last six months, and that longer length turned out to be a possibly fatal flaw. By early June, after only two and a half months on the drug, Carlton Lee decided he was too sick to continue. Carlton stopped taking the drug himself. He said, no more, I can't take it anymore. But it would take almost another three weeks and one patient's emergency diagnosis of shock and liver failure before NIH officially stopped the trial of the hoped-for miracle drug FIAU. The study was terminated on an emergency basis in the early hours of June 26, 1993. Nine days later, the patient started to die. July 5th, a 44-year-old computer specialist. July 6th, a 42-year-old man. July 16th, a 52-year-old Virginian. July 30th, Carlton Lee, dead at age 35. And on August 31st, a 37-year-old woman from North Carolina. I'm going to try to summarize the um, clinical toxicology. That on saw. September 21st, the Food and Drug Administration held a meeting on what went wrong with FIAU and heard the angry testimony of a patient from the first month-long trial, claiming none of this had to happen, that he'd warned NIH of problems a year earlier. What do I want? I want a thorough examination of the process and the players that allowed this to happen. Paul Milstrom told me he was complaining to NIH doctors both verbally and in writing as early as September 1992 about FIAU, that it was causing increasing pain and numbness in his legs and feet, a condition called neuropathy, and a sign that something was poisoning his system. Even though NIH added a test for neuropathy to its study guidelines, Melson says NIH continued to deny that FIAU caused his symptoms. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if you take a toxic substance in April, and that's the only thing toxic you've taken all year, and you end up with a case of neuropathy, uh, that the, the, uh, the FIAU caused the neuropathy. And what was NIH's reaction to Melstrom's angry charges at that recent FDA meeting? An immediate letter from Hufnagel withdrawing all NIH care for Melstrom's ongoing medical problems. The letter read in part, In view of your opinion of us and of the care you receive, it is not appropriate for us at the National Institutes of Health to continue to provide you with medical care or advice. What was your reaction when you read the letter? 
I was angry. New York Congressman Ed Towns heads the House subcommittee overseeing NIH. I could not believe this happened in the United States of America. Towns, who's investigating the incident, says the Hoofnagel letter would clearly intimidate drug trial patients from publicly speaking out. We're talking about research. We're talking about science. And this is not research. This is not science. This is retaliation. Mr. Nelson received a letter from you saying that he was not going to get further treatment from NIH because well, apparently he had gone public with his criticism. Well, because he had uh, said slanderous things about us before the press and things that were totally untrue. How could we continue to care for him if he thinks so lowly of us that he would say the things that he did about us? I, I don't see why he would want us to continue to be his physician. You might not want to continue on with that particular physician, but that does not mean that you do not want to continue on with NIH. And, and do you not feel that NIH has a responsibility to these patients who have been part of the drug we trial? Do have, we do have a responsibility, and we follow all of these patients. And Unless they publicly criticize you. Well, if they say terrible things about us, I mean, as a physician, how can you take care of a person? How can they come to you and trust your judgment? But Pat Wright says Carlton, too, felt intimidated by his doctors. What was Carlton so afraid of in terms of leaving the study? Retaliation. Retaliation. Even in critical condition, Carlton's friends say he still refused their urging to publicly criticize NIH, fearing his doctors would stop his medical care. And I said, Carlton, that's stupid. I mean, I feel so badly now. I called him a wimp, you know, and then I see a copy of the letter that NIH sent Paul Nelson, you know, saying that because he's spoken out and said he's having trouble with the care at NIH, he's not to get any medical services anymore. You know, that was the exact same thing that Carlton was afraid of. In the final analysis, Jay Hoofnagel says that's simply not true. None of the FIAU patients ever had reason to be afraid, he says, but he does admit they did have reason to be angry. And the patient told us, you know, I'm angry, but I don't know who I'm angry at. I'm not angry at myself. I'm not angry at you. Should I be angry at the drug company? I don't even know. You know? Who should they have been angry at? Well, I guess they should have been angry at us. I say time heals all wounds, but I don't think I'll ever get over this. I'm missing the stone heart. If I was 72 and his son was 70, I would not feel this way. But, gosh, I feel robbed. As we said, of the 10 people in FIAU for more than a month, so far five have died. Two more have received liver transplants, while three others suffered only mild toxicity. You should know that Charlton Lee's family is planning a lawsuit against NIH and others. As for Paul Melstrom, the day after we talked to Congressman Towns, NIH reinstated his care. But he, too, says he intends to sue. Still ahead, she seemed to lead a charmed life. The gorgeous singer who glided to stardom met her Prince Charming and lived happily ever after. But then came the disease that changed everything. For the first time, Olivia Newton-John talked intimately about her breast cancer. When prime time continues, after this from our ABC station. When's the best time to get ready for the holiday? Now. Because right now, you can get everything you need to wear and everything you know they want to wear. Plus all the things you need this holiday season for every room in your home. You can get it all now on sale. The free holiday sale. 20 to 50% off everything you need to get you through the holidays in style. The free holiday sale. Start Sunday at Purdue. Just in time. Now a 10 News Update. Brought to you by Cash and Carry. Stephen Ellis brought his family to Florida for a better life. His ended behind the wheel of a taxi cab. Tonight, his widow speaks out. I'm Sue Zelenko. And I'm Dave Wagner. Also on 10 News at 11, meet a police officer who thought he was protected, but we found his vest could have been a deadly seal. And the Bay Area's biggest shipbuilder is in hot water. Bankruptcy. Plus the celebrity TV cell. How the stars are pushing jewelry and astronomical sales. Tonight at 11, where news comes first.
Now you can use your cash and carry receipts to fly at great discounts with Northwest Airlines. Visit cash and carry for details. Then take off with cash and carry in Northwest Airlines. Hey, my name's Steph Ginsburg, and I'm a pastry chef. I own a restaurant. And I cook good food. <laughs> I make a chocolate sushi. Pastelle. Yeah, I think you can tell the difference. Um, they're both sugar, aren't they? Salt Miss Deadly Shields, tonight on Tampa Bay's 10 News at 11. Primetime Live, an ABC News magazine, will continue in a moment. The Ragu Chef created new Ragu Super Vegetable Primavera because we should all eat more vegetables. So his chunkiest sauce ever has vegetables, vegetables, and more vegetables. New Ragu Super Vegetable Primavera. I know. Maybe we can get the package. Martha! Stop! Did you get our package? Gee, it never got here. Really? Introducing tracking software from Federal Express. It was delivered to your place at 9.22 a.m. Oh! Uh, probably stuck in the mailroom. No, it was signed for by your partner, Brian. Now you can track packages right from your computer on your desk. Brian, are you there? Oh, that package, Martha! Well, we can negotiate a deal with this. Introducing Nestle European-style hot chocolate. Savor the richness of Swiss chocolate truffle and make the world go away. Nestle European style hot chocolate. Oh, Mr. Energizer Pammy, out for a stroll. <laughs> is fast, Henry. I mean, you can call them on the telephone and they'll have it waiting for you. Henry, I'm telling you, these guys are faster than you. You don't have to pay for that stuff. Better way to shop, a better way to save. Find great values on garage portable stereos, including this AM-FM digital tuning stereo with CD player and remote control. It's on sale now for just $179.96 at Service Merchandise. Call for the store nearest you. celebrities we see them on the movie screens think we know them and then one day they speak to us from a totally different part of their lives tonight olivia newton john she sat down with nancy collins to talk about the lessons she has learned from a season of tough challenges and triumphs how did you feel when you heard that in fact you I had cancer Say the word. We've got to get used to this word. This word always freaks everybody out. It's just a word, you know. It's a word that describes a condition and it's not a fatal condition necessarily. I mean, strange as it may sound, it was probably the best thing that happened to me. This is Olivia Newton-John today. She says she learned a lot about herself during her recent battle with breast cancer. While recovering at her new oceanfront home in California, she spoke intimately for the first time about her diagnosis 16 months ago. It was startling news coming from the girl who seemed to live a charmed life. This was Olivia Newton-John in the early 70s, when she first broke onto the scene. A perky Australian import who was an instant hit. She would go on to sell 60 million records worldwide, 
and pick up four Grammy Awards. And she made it all look so easy. I just think it was the right place at the right time, and things happened. It was so na no gnashing of your teeth, no dying to do no, it, not getting no, out. No, in fact, mainly it was like, oh, do I have to? <laughs> oh, my God. She asked her parents that same question when she dropped out of high school at 15, an unwelcome move in the family of intellectuals. Her father was a college dean, and her grandfather, Max Born, was a Nobel Prize winner. Yes, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I'm, it's so fantastic to me to know that and wonder what happened to me. <laughs> no, but he was, I mean, in physics, and he was best friends with Einstein. Was he really? And uh, my mother actually translated um, letters between them. How did you feel in this incredibly academic family not being oriented toward academics? <laughs> but she had her own talent. By the time she was a teenager, Newton John was singing in local coffee houses and was a TV star in her own variety show. At 15, she won a talent contest and a trip to London, where she began performing with Cliff Richards, the Elvis Presley of England. By the time she moved to America in 1974, she had already picked up her first Grammy for, oddly enough, Best Country Female Vocalist. What do you think your appeal was? I was the girl next door. I think that's the best. People always seem to, I always look like someone's sister, someone's girlfriend, you know, they, they thought they knew me, there was that kind of... The critics were sort of merciless about you, though. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, they said things like, if, if white bread could sing, <laughs> it, it would be <laughs> Olivia Newton-John. Did those things hurt you? Yes, I think to a certain extent they did, because every artist always wants to be taken seriously or, or to believe, you know, and... Um, critics can belittle you very easily and you forget that you've just gone out in front of 20,000 people they're standing up and they're clapping for you and, and you open the paper the next morning and you go, oh no, they hated me I mean, it's so silly but it's very typical I remember one friend saying to me, what are you worried about? there's some more white bread than anything <laughs> and she certainly sold the movie ticket her first major motion picture went on to become the top grossing movie musical of all time Greece made her a movie star, but her film career fizzled with a musical fantasy called Xanadu, even though the soundtrack went double platinum. Despite the fact that Xanadu was not a terrific film, mm -hmm. it was a great score. And a great score in both accounts, if I might say. <laughs> To say, <laughs> because it was there that you met your husband. Right. Matt Latanzi was a dancer in Xanadu. As an actor, he would go on to play other roles like this one in Rich and Famous. Latanzi was 20 and Newton John 30 when they first met. I had the hang up that he was younger than me. He had no problem with it, but I did. And so we kept it quiet for a long, long time because I was kind of freaked out and I was also worried it wouldn't work because of it. And da -da -da -da. But it did work and they married in 1984 after four years of living together. The romance spawned a new sexy Olivia, who the public initially loved. They bought over two million copies of Let's Get Physical. But the public never embraced this image. Her next album of new material sold under 200,000 copies. To dress up in sexy clothes and all that stuff really wasn't me, you know. It, um, it worked in Greece because that was the character, and it worked for certain things, but basically people like to see me as I am doing the things that I probably do best, you know. In 1986, she took on a new role when daughter Chloe was born. Though she cut an album of lullabies and started an Australian-style clothing business called Koala Blue, her main focus was motherhood, but her bliss was short-lived. In a four-year period, beginning in 1988, her clothing business went bankrupt, she suffered several miscarriages, and then tragedy struck Colette Tudor, the daughter of her best friend, Nancy. Nancy and I were very, very close friends, still are very close. And she was literally a month behind me in her pregnancy. And the babies grew up as sisters. I mean, they were together all the time, and we traveled together, went on holidays together. And it was ideal. It was, you know, dream, dream-like existence. And how old was Colette? Uh, Colette was four when she got sick. She got cancer, uh, a rare cancer called Wilms tumor, and she died when she was five. Did she you feel like it was your child? Or oh, yeah. She was like my other daughter. You know, we were always together. 
Colette's mother believes her daughter's cancer was caused by environmental toxins. She enlisted Newton John when she started the Colette Tuda Environmental Fund to raise money to study children's health. Just last Saturday, Newton John sponsored a star-studded fundraiser at her home. Today's a very special day. We have people from all over the country, and I hope that we can protect our children. Still, there was more bad news. Newton John's father died of cancer in 1992. Days later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had regular checkups with a surgeon, and I also had mammogram, and they didn't show me my mammogram, but I felt innately that there was something wrong. And my surgeon did uh, a needle biopsy. He didn't show me a needle biopsy either, so he, he asked me to have a, a lumpectomy where they would take a look. And they found it, and it was tucked right at the back, hidden, you know, so if, if I hadn't had regular checkups with this particular doctor and he hadn't watched my progress, um, and I hadn't been paying attention to my body, because I felt I knew something was wrong. Were you afraid at all? Oh, no, not for a second. No, of course I was. Especially the first, I mean, the, the scariest night really was the first night. I had to go in to have these special tests where they put radioactive stuff in your body and you sit on a big machine. And I, I don't like anything in my body, I, you know, especially radioactive material. Please, I'm going to glow, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. That really was the worst moment for me. And I made a decision. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to let everyone know that I'm going to be all right. And they have to decide I'm going to be all right. And I really think... There's so much power in thought and so much power in your mind. And I when did you know you had to have chemotherapy? Um, I was still in hospital. And he actually, my doctor told me that I would have to have it. So that was actually my second scary moment because I was very afraid of chemotherapy because I'd watched Colette go through it and how ill it made her. And I had all these, you know, the horrible visions of what it was like. But it was very important to support um, chemotherapy with all the things I did. I, I had acupuncture, I had massage, I did yoga. You had a tumor in one, in one breast, mm -hmm. right? Well, what choices did they give you? Well, they recommended a mistake. They did? Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's not called, it's a, called a modified radical. So they don't, they take a lot, but they don't take everything. So that I, I was able to have an implant right away, which I was very fortunate. And I'd recommend that to women, that if they have that chance, they should do it because it makes it a lot, a lot easier to cope with. Do they do it right after surgery? Right during surgery. So they do it all at one time. Oh, so you come out? You come out and you have one. So you've lost one, but you gain a new one. It's like a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think caused the cancer? Um, these are all instinctual things that doctors would probably fight me on. Um, I would had a, a number of pregnancies that hadn't, that had, you know, I had lost the baby. I was on the pill. I was under incredible stress. Um, How did you tell Chloe that you had? I didn't. I didn't tell her. I decided not to because of what she'd gone through with Colette. And for her, the word cancer means you die. She found out in Australia after it was all over and I was healing. And she got very cross. She uh, yeah, she said, why didn't you tell me, Mommy, I could have taken care of you? Now, you say that you've licked it. What does that mean? Um, it's over. So, as far as I'm concerned, I'm cured. And that's the main decision, and that's the decision you have to make. A uh, Western doctor probably would not tell me I was cured. I mean, they work on statistics, but I have to just work on feeling and instinct. So. She even built what she calls a healing home, a kind of tribute to Colette, designed by her architect father, James Tudor. It's an environmentally correct house constructed with insulation made from seawater, non-toxic paint, and timber ecologically harvested from the rainforest. She says that spiritual feeling enhances her new life. I think I'm a different person than I was two years ago. I think I go with my instincts, I trust myself now. I feel really happy. I feel, I still feel I'm charmed, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> And for her next project, Olivia Newton-John is co-producing and recording a new album in Australia. The first time she's written all the lyrics and music herself. Still to come, bear terror. When prime time continues.
How's dinner looking? Sort of empty, huh? I can help. Lipton Golden Saute Pasta. Delicate pastas, seasonings, yummy saute taste. New Golden Saute Pasta. The saute taste that's on your side. And mine. Mmm. I've been a stage and screen director for a long time, and so I've been an actress for a long time. For 30 years, we put money in Dreyfus Mutual Funds every month. Dreyfus is the leader in mutual funds. These mutual funds, we're diversified into many, many stocks. That's good. Now they say the play is the thing. Our mutual funds aren't too bad either. You're saying it all. Let's do this again. <laughs> Wait a minute. You build a new razor with precision head to shave below the skin in comfort. And what do you get? Cut a precision groove to help the Norel boat lift and cut system shave even closer. And what do you get? Build a razor that shaves closer, smoother than ever before. And what do you get? The new Norelco razors. Our closest shave ever. This is hydroplaning in less than an inch of water, and they're being pulled by Goodyear all-season Aquatread radials. Aquatread's deep groove design channels water away as you drive for outstanding traction. Hydroplaning, Aquatreading. Think about it. The Port of Tampa takes a hit in its biggest asset. American shipbuilders filed for bankruptcy. I'm Sue Zolenko. And I'm Dave Wagner. Also on 10 News at 11, the widow of a slain cabbie makes a passionate plea to help find a killer. And they're supposed to protect police, but are some vests actually deadly sealed? Tampa Bay's 10 News is next. The winner of the Academy Award for Best Picture, now with never-before-seen footage. It's the world television premiere of Kevin Costner's Dances with Wolves. Sunday at 8, 7 Central. Every now and then, we bring you something for no other reason than it made us stop and watch when we saw it. Whatever the cause, this has been a week for bad news bears in two separate places. We emphasize no one was seriously hurt in either incident, but it was scary. First in Poland, look. A muzzled, declawed bear was escorted onto a TV talk show. If you have illusions bears are cuddling, watch as two different people go down. Again, no one was seriously hurt. And then thousands of miles away at the zoo in China, an unsuspecting visitor takes a rest at the panda cave. you might say, for the phrase, fashion victim. Let's hope that panda doesn't decide it needs a bandana to go with its jacket. Sam? Diane, next week we'll have a special primetime edition you can't afford to miss. Here's a preview. One murder every 22 minutes. One rape every five minutes. One robbery every 47 seconds. You've heard the number. We'll tell you how to avoid becoming another statistic. From guns in the home, to carjacking, to child abduction. Next week, Primetime reports how you can be safe in America. First, an experiment that will shock parents everywhere. Hey, Shorty! My dog! Kids who've been taught not to go with strangers. Lured away by a man with a believable story. Shorty! I got a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. We'll hear from the experts, including a child abductor, to find out what you can do to protect your kids. And we used to feel secure in our cars. Now everyone's worried about carjacking. We'll go back to our old friend, safety expert J.J. Bittenbinder, who says you can outwit the bad guys. They are not smarter than you are. I've been throwing these guys up against the wall for 22 years. There are no Mensa cars in their pockets. And we'll take you to a community where they've drastically reduced crime by getting tough with juvenile offenders. We call these kids what they are. They're serious habitual offenders and they need to be locked up. Also, how much safer are you with a gun in your home? What makes you a vulnerable target for criminals? What should you do if you're attacked? All that and more next week when we devote an hour to how to be safe in America. 2020 tomorrow night. I'm Diane Sawyer in New York. Good night to you and good night, Sam. 
Good night, Diane. I'm Sam Donaldson in Washington. Later on Nightline, the rise of the religious right, perhaps the largest grassroots movement in recent history. Join us next Thursday for a special edition of Primetime Live. The American Broadcasting Company, ABC.